Thank you very much for letting me come share my story with you. I really appreciate it. Kind of as we as we do a big wrap up of Breast Cancer Month, um, it's it's just important for me to be able to share my story knowing and acknowledging that I am one of a million voices. Um, and by that I mean just in this area. There are millions of, millions more around the world and their voices are equally important or more important to be heard, but I'll, I'll do what I can to represent all of them. Um, so how did, how did I get here? How did I end up here? Uh, I started, I am from currently Atlanta, but as you can tell by my deep southern accent, I'm not really from there, I'm from, <laughs> I'm from Chicago. Um, <laughs> I grew up here, was raised here. Things I thought were going wonderfully. I married uh, a brilliant computer engineer and we were working out in the Oak Brook area. This was several years ago and it was when the dot-com bubble was kind of up and running and burst. For those of you that don't know that story, it was kind of, kind of difficult. There were grand layoffs going corporate-wide at that point, so entire departments would be gone, you know, immediately. And so, uh, my husband and I worked for the same company out there in Oak Brook, and at one point, um, it was such that if, if you were going to be laid off that day, the HR department would send an email in the morning, and then you'd know, oh, well, I won't be here by lunch. So my husband gets this email and then sends me a message. He's like, listen, I, I got the email, so things, I'm like, oh, no, no, we had a little, I kid you not, a, a house with a white picket fence in Glen Ellen. Like, my life was, and I refer to Glen Ellen as utopia, unabashed, no matter where I speak. And so he says, I got the message two hours later, he says, meet me in the lobby, the coffee shop. I'm like, okay. So I go down to the lobby and there's my husband with a cup of tea for me and a cup of coffee for him and this like crazy grin on his face. And I'm like, oh. So I was instantly relieved. You know, I sat down, I'm like, oh, you didn't get fired? And he's like, oh no, whole department gone, engineering gone. I'm like, what? Why are we smiling? And he said, <laughs> because I've been thinking about this. <clears throat> Keep in mind, this was in the morning, and this it was started in the morning, this was in the afternoon, so it's been like three hours, right? He said, I've been thinking about this, and I believe that I should leave engineering, become a pastor, and go study uh, the ministry in Indiana. There's a school. It's been hours, right? And, and I said, what do, you, what do you mean you've decided? He said, no, no, I've been thinking about this. I think this is important. And I said, because I as well, I'm a person of faith, and I said, I prayed this morning, and God didn't mention Indiana, so. <laughs> You need to get yourself a job. And he's like, no, 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 this is how it's going. And one never argues with the divine. So in fact, we relocated out to Fort Wayne, Indiana, so he could study ancient dead languages and God. And many, many, many uh, degrees later, he, he actually became a pastor. But when we were out there, my friend from Chicago said, listen, I don't know how far away this is, because really, we kind of live in a beautiful bubble here. Indiana is just one of those states that you go over to get to New York. We don't really know much about it. And they said, in uh, Indianapolis, um, there's a really great cancer organization, and you should you should consider working for them. The reason that he said that to me is because my mom was 42 years old when she died from breast cancer. Many, many people in her family also have passed from breast cancer, so he knew it was crucial to me. He knew that my mom, and I always say her name when I speak, her name is Roberta, because I think it's important that we say the names of those we've lost, because they're crucial, right? She was an incredibly important person in my life, and he said, if you can do I was a database administrator. He said, if you can do that kind of work down there, then you should because it'll be beneficial. Well, Fort Wayne and Indianapolis are several hours away, so I wasn't going to do that kind of a commute. However, I did find a company that was able to use, utilize my talents, and I did things like walks and runs, and I licked yogurt lids, and I bought things with pink ribbons on it, and had no idea where the money was going. I just knew that I was helping somehow. Someone like my mom was getting helped somewhere, I thought. I had hoped. Uh, so we kind of we kind of plow along. I'm working. We now have three beautiful little girls. Um, things are going great. And then I come home from work one day, and my husband has tea waiting for me and coffee. And, and at this point, I'm like back slowly away. <laughs> so I said, "What's going on?" And he said, "Well, um, we get to do something called a vicarage, which is like an internship. We get to relocate for ten months somewhere." I get to learn under a pastor, and then we get to move back, and I can finish school. And I'm like, oh, why, why do we have to do this? So, um, and to Joliet, Illinois, we get to relocate. And for those of you unfamiliar um, with the Blues Brothers, the Joliet has a prison and apparently a church, and that was about it. So I wasn't like overly enthusiastic about going there. Uh, but upon arrival, so my husband has been, he was a computer engineer, now he's going to school, right? And upon arrival, the pastor says, I'm supposed to coach you on what it's like to run an organization that is a church. You know, 
how the building works, where, where you get paper towels, things like that. He said, I can't help you because my wife has been diagnosed with breast cancer. And it's invasive, so I'm giving you this church and stepping away so I can take care of her. Now, in my mind, I thought it was all about me. <laughs> and I said, I know why I'm here. I'm supposed to help this woman. Because when I was with my mom, I walked her through her treatment. And so I knew what someone needs when they're going through chemotherapy. I knew that you get really cold, your extremities get cold, so you need really thick socks, right, and gloves. And sometimes you're cold, sometimes you're hot, but like a nice pashmina, things like that. Um, you're very scent um, oriented, like you cannot be around really strong scents. So anything unscented, chapstick, you get really dry, chapstick, lotions, things like that. And funny reading materials. You need things that are uplifting and hopeful. When my mom was sick, one of the books that was given to her was How to Plan Your Will. Oh, which is brutal. You don't want something like that. So I got all the goofiest things I could find and like, you know, um, HGTV magazines, things like that to help uplift the mood. I put them all in a bag and I gave them to this woman, this, this pastor's wife. And she said, she opened the bag and she's like, I told you I have cancer and you gave me chapstick and some socks. Like, well, how does this equal? Like, I don't understand. And she came back to me a month later and she said, when I opened that bag, I thought it was a bunch of junk. I didn't realize what I was supposed to do with it. She said, but your stuff is the only stuff I've used consistently to the end. She said, I had no idea. And I thought, isn't that the perfect euphemism for life? You kind of open up every day and you're like, what is this junk? What am I supposed to do with this? If you use it properly, if you understand and open your, open your mind, you can realize that, that things are there for a reason, right? You can use all of these things. So we're down in Joliet, and um, my husband is going through, like, handling all this pressure. And um, I learned that I'm pregnant with my fourth child, so things aren't all that bad out on Vicarage. However, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm changing my daughter's crib one day. And since we've moved, right, over and over again, um, the crib is broken, so the side doesn't go down like it's supposed to. So thankfully, I'm like a giant, like nine feet tall, right? So I'm able to lean over and change the change the crib sheet, but when I stand back up, I snagged what I thought was a button on my shirt. But in fact, I was wearing something very much like this. There was no button, but there was a very hard nodule on my breast. And I thought, oh, oh no, you know, your mind goes a thousand miles an hour. Um, so I went to see my OBGYN, and I didn't care if I was in Kentucky, I would have still driven to my OBGYN up here in Chicago because I loved her so much. So drove up and she's like, okay, well, um, with your family history, you know, I'm not quite sure what's going on, but let's let's do a needle biopsy and see what this is. And so for those of you that don't know, a needle biopsy, they actually insert a needle into a mass and extract tissue or fluid to see, you know, whether or not it's it's malignant, whether or not it's cancer. And so this needle biopsy comes back fine. Fine. Results negative. Nothing bad. Uh, my husband presents me with this information when I drive home one day, and as he's hugging me, he's like, so relieved, congratulations. There's something in the back of my mind you know how sometimes you just know it's, things are still not quite right, don't know what it is. Uh, about a week later, I went back to my OBGYN for my regular baby appointment, and she says, I know this sounds crazy, but this thing feels like it's bigger. It's only been a few days, but it feels bigger to me, and that's alarming. She said, now, as we all know, when you're pregnant, your body goes through changes. This could be anything. Um, it could be just like a milk duck going crazy. We don't know. So we're going to do a lumpectomy which is surgery, where they physically go in and remove this, this mass. And for those of you that have never had any kind of surgery like this, A, good for you, yay. B, <laughs> this is what it looks like, I'll give you a visual. So they kind of lay you down, strap you down, and they put up a little blue fabric screen and you get, get wheeled in. And since I was pregnant, I was not, um, I was only locally anesthetized. Um, because usually, you know, it, it, for something this severe, they would have put me to sleep, but since I was awake. And surgeons apparently have a very different kind of discussion with the nurses. When you're asleep, they can say whatever they want, they can do whatever they want. So he's like sniping around and being kind of like, oh, that poor nurse laying there, God, he's so mean. Well, at one point, he makes the incision, and I kid you not, this is what he says out loud, oh my God, that's what he says. And I'm laying there, I'm like, and, and then everything else is silent. So now I want to peek over, like, is there a hand coming out? Like, what, <laughs> what are you seeing <laughs> that is causing you such alarm? And the nurse, calm as the water, um, kind of explains to me. She said, I know you heard that, so I'm gonna tell you what we're seeing. Um, we can see the track marks from the needle biopsy we did on this little mass, and that indeed 
looks fine as we determined. She said, but what we couldn't see, you know, they couldn't do um, mammograms on me because I'm pregnant at that point. She said, what we couldn't see is that you have something called nested tumors, a group of tumors. And they're large and they have fingers. I don't know what fingers are, but I'm laying there uh, confident that they're not good, right? So at, at one point, um, this nested tumor, this group of tumors was so large, I actually felt like I was on fire in the surgery. And I screamed in pain. And the nurse said, are, are you feeling that? And I said, yeah. I said, it sounds crazy, but I feel like I'm on fire. And she said, no, we were afraid of this. Um, we had hoped this wouldn't happen. We're cauterizing you because it's so large, we weren't sure if we had if we had given you enough anesthesia. So they went back in and re-anesthetized to remove it. So as I'm getting wheeled out of that surgery, my daughter, who was at that time about seven, ran over to me and she said, Mommy, we heard a lady screaming in there. And I said, oh, we should pray for whoever that was. Because <laughs> you never want the kids to know everything, right? So it turns out that these nested tumors were not my friend. They were, in fact, stage 3B um, breast cancer. And I was estrogen-based breast cancer. My cancer is fed by the estrogen in my body, which is, when you're pregnant, increased, amplified, right? Because that helps the baby grow. It helps you get strong. And unfortunately, also feeds my cancer. So now what do we do? Like, I, I have no idea. I've never been in this situation. I'm 36 years old. My mom's been gone forever. No one I know was in this situation, right? And I did at that time, there was no mechanism for me to locate someone else like this. And so I go to see an, um, an oncologist, a cancer doctor. And much like any other serious disease you have, or, or ailment, or, or you know, kind of clinical diagnosis, they gave me a bunch of pamphlets, like from the 70s. You know, Here's the type of chemo you're going to get. Here are the side effects. Here's what you can do to prevent, on and on and on. And the last one, um, before they turned the pamphlet over, and keep in mind, this is 13 years ago, almost 14 years ago. Before the pamphlet was turned over, they said, We've talked about it with the other um, clinicians in the practice, and we're pretty confident that this is the only way to go. We've never had a pregnant patient, so we think terminating your pregnancy is the only way to go. And I thought, but what about, what about choice? What about education? Isn't there something that we can do? And the answer was yes. The something we can do is wait, and if you live long enough to have the baby, we'll treat you afterwards. And I thought, that is, that is wholly unacceptable to me. Like I. I'm selfish, I want all, I want both. I want to live and I want to meet this baby. So unbeknownst to me, a friend of mine had made a few calls. And one of the calls she made was to Indianapolis, Indiana, ironically. And she said, uh, explain to this doctor that she spoke to, look, this woman is panicking. It's a very serious situation. They're telling her she has to move now because of the severity of the cancer, the aggressiveness. You know, is there any way that you could get her in? And this man moved heaven and earth to clear his calendar, this doctor. I had never heard of him. I didn't know about him. And she didn't tell me she was making these calls. So I get, a, um, I get a call from my friend. She's like, call this guy. Just before you do anything, just see what he says. Get a second opinion. Now, I am a child of immigrants. And a second opinion is an insult to a lot of people. When your doctor says something, that's God. You don't question. You just do exactly what they say. So for me, it was like, well, all right, I'll try it. But gosh, I don't want to insult the first doctor. I don't know what to do. She said, just call. So I call the doctor down in Indianapolis, and his name is George Sledge. And he says, let's say it's a Tuesday. He said, why don't you come on in tomorrow? Why don't you come in on Wednesday? And I said to George Sledge, who was the president of the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, unknown to me, I said, what kind of a quack are you if you have availability like this? <laughs> like, I can't see my dentist, right, for six months. I can't get my hair done for three weeks. Like, how do you have time? Just, like, you just got to squeeze me. Did you even go to school? Like, are you So, yes, it turned out this brilliant genius man cleared everything to make room for me. And he said, when you come, bring your tumor with you. And I'm like, I, I don't have a hazmat suit. I'm not quite sure how to tote this around. He's like, no. Oh, it's going to be in a little slide. So I put the slide in a box, and I put the box in the seat next to me, and I buckled it in, and I yelled at it from here to Indianapolis. I hate you! I hate you! Driving all the way down cornfield, soybeans, just screaming at this thing. And when I arrived at the cancer center, Dr. Sledge says, this is a, a learning hospital, so it's affiliated with a university, Indiana University. And he said, if you don't mind, I have some interns who would like to come in and observe. And 
if you've ever been in that situation, they look like they're 12 years old and they have clipboards and they're all shaky, you know, and I'm like, well, I'm completely naked. Bring them all in. That'll be great. So in come the 12 year olds with George and they have their little slides and they're looking at it and they kind of powwow in the corner and George wheels around and, and I'll never forget it. It's like it happened yesterday. He wheels around on the little chair with no back and he says, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to save that little baby and while we're at it, we're going to save you too. And I thought, that's what's missing. I didn't need any lies or pretense. I just needed hope, just a little grain of hope. And he never said, oh, it'll be easy. As a matter of fact, he said, we've made such incredible advancements in cancer treatment. We now can make sure you don't lose your hair. You don't get nauseous. Your white blood cell count is kept up. When you're pregnant, none of that counts. But we have made advancements since you lost your mom. And you've got to trust just a little and work really hard. And I said, OK, that's all I need. All I need is a little hope. And so we began this incredible journey. We would drive from Joliet every Friday to Indianapolis. And I would be treated for nine hours because when they give you the same medication, but they give it very slowly, they, they know what has, what will and will not cross the placental barrier. So they know how to administrate it, but it takes, takes a while. And so afterwards, when you're done with chemotherapy, typically you're very sick. And so I thought, gosh, how are we going to, like, I can't drive back all that way every Friday. Um, and one of the nurses said, listen, go to this. Um, there's a hotel here called the Westin in Indianapolis. Just go talk to them and tell them you're a patient of George's. And I'm like, and I look it up online. It's like $250 a night. I'm like, <laughs> three little kids. I'm pregnant. My husband's in school. I, like, I don't think we can afford that. She said, just tell them. And so the manager says to me at the Westin, do you think you could afford like $20? And I said, yeah, but how can you make that happen? He said, I'm giving you the room for free, but to park your car underneath the building, it costs $20. Would you be willing to do that? And that was the very first example I saw of unbelievable, unabashed compassion in the world that I didn't know existed. I had no idea that people would be able to do things like that. And the second example came with my eldest daughter. So we were in, um, we were in Joliet, but she was going to school in Lombard, a little school. And so she was about eight years old at this point. And my fear was, at that age, I didn't want her to miss a full year of school, right? Because every Friday, she would be gone. And then Monday, you know, recovering, how could we do that? And so her school stepped up, and, and all the moms got together and said, we are going to have a surprise slumber party every Friday night for Alex, every Friday night. And so we plow through. And as you, as you know, we get about halfway through the class, and there's no more girls. <laughs> so now there's only little boys left. And they don't care, right? They're little. Most of them have little sisters, so they all ask, all right, Alex, will you spend the night? We'll have fun. Alex never missed a meal. Her grades were perfect. Everything, probably better meals than I was making, quite frankly. All these women, like, <laughs> rolled out the red carpet for her. And they go all the way through until the last little guy, and his name was Michael. And because he still lives here, I'm not going to give you his last name. Michael. <laughs> Michael doesn't like humans very much, so he was very hesitant to ask Alex. So he didn't want to. And so his mom puts her little hands on his bumper. And she's like, Michael, go ask Alex. So he goes over to Alex, and he says, Alex, do you want to spend the night at my house? And Alex, secretly in love with Michael for several years, <laughs> says, oh, I'd love to. And she turns around really loud and says, Mommy, he does love me. I'm like, yes, of course. <laughs> So that's another example of unbelievable compassion. They stepped in and took care of this little girl. And it was not easy. It was incredibly difficult. There were so many times when I was just laying on the bathroom floor, sick as could be, just holding my stomach, thinking, please, 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 just all I want to do is see this baby. I just want to meet him or her. It doesn't have to be you know, perfectly healthy, all 10 fingers, 10 toes. I don't care. I just want to meet this baby. That's all I'm shooting for. Please, please, Lord. And at one point, you know, I am hugely pregnant, have no hair. And it's not like, you know, in the movies when Halle Berry goes through chemo, like she's gorgeous no matter what. But like, you lose your eyebrows, you lose your eyelashes, everything. And it's cold, right? And there are reasons we have eyelashes physically, not just to be beautiful, but like it keeps snow out of your eyes. And so like, it's crazy. And I was cold. And so I, every time I looked in the mirror, I saw my older brother. And it was like, ah, <laughs> bald, you know? And I was supposed to let you know that he's working out now, so he doesn't look like it. Nonetheless, so at one point, my friend says, 
he's in musical theater, and he said, you know, you just don't feel feminine. That's the problem. You need to address your femininity. I'm like, look at me. And this is before cell phones, right? So I only, I thought it was cool because I had a speaker phone. And he says, go to the store and get some fake eyelashes, and I'll walk you through how to apply them. I'm like, all right, Mr. Theater. So I go to the store, and um, you can take a note of this if you want to. If you're going to buy your first set of fake eyelashes, and it's like the first week of November, when you walk into the CVS, that's the Halloween clearance, my <laughs> friends. <laughs> that's not divine intervention saying, here's your eye eyelashes, Heidi. No, which is what I thought it was. I'm like, glamour length. I don't know what that is. So I get all the stuff he tells me to, and I put the speakerphone in the bathroom, and he's like, OK, put the glue dots on there. Put those eyelashes on, girl, and you stand up and tell me what you see. And so I was like this. <sighs> He's like, well, and I said, I look like a pregnant drag queen. <laughs> and he's like, yes. I'm like, no, no, no. I don't think that's what the church wants to see. So I decided just to go completely natural. But it was one of those situations that pointed out that pe people can help without doing anything extraordinary. They can just use their skill set to help kind of guide you gently through. Um, and so we went through that entire season. We went through weeks and weeks, the entire pregnancy, I went through getting chemotherapy. And then um, they realized that my cancer was so very aggressive, they wanted to go in and get remove it because they didn't get clean margins from the sur first surgery. But the baby wasn't quite done cooking, so I had to get a few. Um, they had to do amniocentesis, which is a needle the size of me, roughly getting stabbed <laughs> into your belly to make sure that the baby was OK. And it turns out that the baby um, wasn't, um, his lungs weren't fully developed, so they had to do some steroid injections. And so they kind of, when they wheel me in for the surgery, I'm kind of whispering out loud, please, 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 I just want to see him. I just, just want to see. I just want to see. And so they take the baby out, and the doctor says, it's a boy. Now, keep in mind, I've had girls all along. So the doctor says, it's a boy. My husband says to me, it's a boy. And I'm like, are you sure? And he says to her, are you sure? And she's like, I've seen him before. This is a boy. Now, what she had been preparing me for this whole time she was using terms like compromised immune system, which I get. I'm an intelligent person. I, I've read everything I could. I know what that means. What I didn't understand were the ramifications. When the baby is born with a compromised immune system and you yourself have a compromised immune system, you can't be together. You, you're too dangerous for one another. So the baby immediately went to the NICU. And as a mom, and I know that there are people here who understand, when you have a baby in the NICU, no matter what you're going through, that's the worst. I don't care what you do to me, what you poke and prod on me, just make sure he's perfect. That's all that matters to me. And there are different types of mom in that situation. So when you're a healthy mom and a healthy baby at the hospital, everything's great, you go home, things are great. When you're a healthy mom and a sick baby in the hospital, you can still go see that baby. When you're a sick mom and a sick baby, you just listen outside and hear all the moms going in to see their baby. And I just wanted to see him. I just wanted to kiss him, I just wanted to touch him, and I couldn't. And it was excruciating for me. But my husband named him Noah because he said he made it through the flood. And it was awesome. And he was born at almost 22 inches long, even though he was only <laughs> like almost five pounds. So he was as long as skinny as you could imagine. My husband was trying to give me a visual. He's like, listen, um, he couldn't take pictures for some reason at that point. But he said, he's huge in that little bassinet thing. Like, he's the biggest kid in there. And he's fine. He'll be fine. It just took a while for him to get out. Um, but when he did, it was amazing to me. It was amazing to see him and know that because of research, my doctor knew what to do when other people didn't and were too afraid of litigious action or just their own inability to handle it. It really speaks powerfully to kind of what was going on there. And my doctor said when I was done, he said, listen, we're doing a fundraiser, and I'd like you to come speak. And I said, I, I'm a database administrator. I don't speak to humans really out loud <laughs> and he's like no no this is really important because we we need this new device it's important he said plus you've told me before it's about hope what if we can just give hope he said it's not your story what if it's Noah's story what if it's my story what if it's the research story just share it and let other people know and he said if there's 12 people in the room if there's 300 people in the room one of them will need to hear this. And it's none of your business who, you just need to say it. And he said, and when you get to the end, don't tell them how Noah is. I want to come in like the Lion King and <laughs> hold him. And I was like, well, that sounds ridiculous. OK, whatever. So I agreed to do it. And 
it was one of those events, it was a fundraiser, and there was a lot of women drinking all through the whole night. And by the time I finished my speak, it, speech and he wheels Noah in, they're all crying, they all want to touch him. And by the time he had gotten three rows in, we'd raised enough money for him to get that microscope, and then he kept walking. <laughs> and I realized at that point, that might be what I'm supposed to do. I'm just supposed to let people know that we've come far, yes, Yes, we've lost way too many people. Yes, I lost my mom. But what if I can stop something this generation so it doesn't touch the next generation? And I didn't realize how impactful that was until my cancer came back about six years ago. And I had gone through a double mastectomy at this, at this point. And my daughter's teacher pulled her aside. And so this is my second eldest daughter. Pulled her out into the hallway and said, listen, I just want to tell you, we got a note from your dad and your mom is okay, and her breast cancer surgery went okay. And my daughter said, why are you telling me out here? And she said, because I didn't want to embarrass you in front of your friends. And my daughter says, in like third grade, what if there's another little girl in there whose mom has breast cancer? I don't want her to be ashamed. I want people to know that this is not my mom's fault. We just have to help each other. And I was like, done. <laughs> Check. <laughs> That's what we need to do. We have to empower our own children, our own daughters to say, you have done nothing wrong with this body to cause this to happen, but you can do something right going forward to get that word out and to push as hard as you can. And so I've really kind of devoted myself to that at this point. So Noah is now 14 years old. He's 6'1", still weighs a little more than five pounds, just a tiny little thing. But he's strong and powerful, as are my daughters, because they went through it as well. Um, and my husband has numerous degrees and can speak any ancient dead language you need him to. Um, <laughs> but I have found myself in a, in a very unique position in that I have embraced everything I could to try to help other women and men with breast cancer and their families. And, and I found it in unusual ways, mostly through social media. Like, I find that to be a beacon of hope. And I realize it's used for like the worst things, but in my mind, it's also used for the best. Um, I'm gonna kind of scoot forward if I can. So up on this screen, you can see a hashtag called BCSM. So every Monday night at 9 p.m., BCSM is Breast Cancer Social Media. There's a group of us that get together on Twitter and we ask each other three questions. And it's run and moderated by a woman who is a breast surgeon. Um, and a woman who recently passed away, and then another woman who's an advocate. And we put these three questions out to the world, and everyone answers from around the world, Australia, Canada, Japan, everywhere. So, and the questions could be lighthearted, like, what kind of um, art did you find that helps you going through your treatment? Like, what gives you relief? Or really hard questions. How do you plan your will? What do you do if you're a single mom? How do you take care of your children? Things like that, heavy questions. And then the answers are compiled and put together so that we can go back and review. And we get millions of impressions one hour on Monday night. And it has really become a lifeline for many people, um, quite literally a lifeline. There was one, gosh, this was probably f six years ago, a woman went on um, BCSM and she said, I'm pregnant and I'm scared and I don't know what to do. And so, and she was in Texas, this young woman on the, on the Texas-Mexico border, and I started talking to her, and she said, everyone tells me I can't have the baby, and so I immediately, I'm texting pictures of Noah, hey, look, you can't, <laughs> here's Dr. Sledge, look at this baby, he won't look like yours, but here you go. <laughs> so we're going through and we're talking, and she said, okay, I'm gonna try this. So she, she gets herself over to, um, I think Baylor in Houston, I'm not sure, she goes to one of the big hospitals, and they said, yeah, we, we know about George Sledge, we can treat you. So she did. She made that trek herself, got through it, and she had a little daughter that she named Serenity. And she knows that she's here because she connected with someone, and not just me, I connected her with the whole world. She was connected, she had um, triple negative breast cancer. So not my type, but I connected her with someone else who did, who was also pregnant. So this, this weird little combination of people helped encourage her in a way that she needed. Um, LinkedIn is another unutilized resource in the world of so in, in the world of nonprofits I found because it's all business driven how can I get a job but I find if you just go out there and connect with people and say things like thank you thank you large corporation because I know what you gifted to breast cancer research this year and so I just want to say thank you because I'm the girl that you helped and you didn't know that and you, you'll never meet me but I just wanted you to know and people are blown away because I'm not asking for anything I'm just sharing um, and very recently, I was asked to go speak at a ball, believe it or not, <laughs> um, and it was a fundraiser, for, it was called the Pink Tie event, um, focused on men in the community. 
and I needed a ball gown. And I'm like, you know, this might surprise you, I don't have ball gowns, like lying about the house. Um, and so I didn't know what to do, and they were prohibitively expensive. And so I wasn't sure. So I connected with Candace Jordan. She's connected with me here in Chicago. She writes for the Tribune, and she's a, like a social person. Um, and she said, listen, there's a group here that I need you to connect with, and um, they'll, she'll be able to help you get a gown. I'm like, OK, I don't know, I don't know who you're talking about. Um, Robin from Model. Robin's actually here to, from Model, can you pronounce the name of your company for me? Model Okay, yes, isn't that lovely? I can't say that. So there you are. <laughs> so she's, she is a former model and now a dress designer who's very tall like myself, and she said, I'll set you up. And she is really, really driven. She has a confidence campaign that she puts out on her website, and I thought, I, okay, I'll try it. And I said to her, one request, I'm a breast cancer patient, I've got scars all over, it's gotta be like really modest, and she's like, no problem, I got you, don't be afraid. She writes me this beautiful letter, you are lovely, sends me a dress that has a v-neck so low. <laughs> it's down here, dear Robin, I love you, this is not for me, and she's like, turn it around. I'm like, oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I turn around and it's glamorous and wonderful and it feels like, you know, soft and wonderful. And it's all because I connected with someone on LinkedIn six years ago and said, thank you for doing that event. And then she reconnected with me. All of that happened. And it's not just that. Like, we use it to help each other, a lot of women. Um, and I'm going to tell you, like, this is just what happened this week. Um, so this woman in California said she just found out that all of her rides, so she is a single mom in Southern California getting to her treatment. And someone was giving her rides. I think it was the American Cancer Society. I'm not sure. But their program was defunded because they didn't have enough money. Now she's stuck. She doesn't know how she's going to drive to her treatments. The financial toxicity of cancer is horrific. And she didn't know what to do. And this was on the 4th. By the 6th, she had already found rides because she went out on Twitter, did the BCSM, and we're like, OK, I'll pay for your Lyft for a month. And someone else is like, I'll pay for your Uber the next month. Like, we'll get you there. That's the kind of thing that happens. And it's not always like money driven, you know, even though that's a huge need, sometimes there are other things, airline miles, hotel points. And that's big because there are so many different events happening around the country and around the world to help empower patients and educate them. So like, I need more surgery, I know I do, but I don't know my options. I can go online and look, but I really wanna to talk to somebody, but I, I can't afford to, to fly over to California to learn that. But if I could get the airline miles, I could get there and sit down in front of a surgeon and say, here, here's what we're looking at. Tell me what we can do. Um, and that's another thing. There are doctors. There are the, the health care, the intersection of healthcare and social media. We're on the brink of something phenomenal, I think, because all the patients are out there talking. So are the doctors. And so is pharma. So we're all in there together. Although pharma is just really lurking. They're not really talking because they're very, <laughs> they're afraid, <laughs> right? And so I speak at a lot of pharma events. And all I'm doing is cheering them on and championing them. Talk to us or listen to us. Because we're not just out there saying, oh, my side effects are terrible. We're saying, yes, they're hard. Here's how to combat them. And I'm still alive. We're not all bashing you. We really want to work together. Um, there was one doctor who put out on BCSM this on the 6th. She said, one of the really bad parts of being an oncologist is having people thank you after you have to tell them that they're dying. Today really sucked. So does cancer. And this was a doctor in Kansas who said this. And the responses were amazing, not just from other doctors, but from patients saying, I know you don't want to hear, but thank you anyway. Like, it really matters to us that you're kind when you tell us these things. And the doctors were saying, it's just an honor to do this. Um, I cry every time as soon as they're gone. And another one said, the first thank you baffled me. I just sat there because I'm like, how can you thank me for telling you this? But they weren't thanking you for the news. They're thanking you for your compassion in your heart. And sometimes when they talk about clinical trials, they're thanking you for the hope. Once again, just a little grain of hope. And that's kind of my whole theme. If we can just impart a little bit of hope and share with one another, that's, that's, what, that's what really matters. And that's why I'm... I'm really, really proud to be working with the organizations that I am. And I'm not, I'm not paid by them. I'm not sponsored by them. Actually, this, um, the Pink Fund um, is kind of amazing because they pay bills for women, families who are going through treatment, light bills, electric, gas, mortgage, things like that, so that you don't have to worry about making the decision between, you know, do I, do I go to radiation this week or do I keep my kids in the house? Like, that kind of thing is enormous. Um, and the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, they're all about lobbying which, again, when I was asked to first start speaking, I was like, I can't do that. 
And when someone said, you need to go lobby Congress, I said, I definitely can't do that. Like, that's terrifying. I don't know what to do. But they train you, they educate you so that you can go in and start speaking. And I brought one of my daughters last year when we were lobbying for the um, Women's Health Medicaid Bill, which, among other things, encourages... Um, insurance companies not to say, wait till you're age 50 or 55 to get a mammogram, get them as young as you want. Because sometimes your family says, you know, well, you're 35 with a diagnosis. And I brought my daughter with me and she lobbied right along with me. And it's almost as if they were deliberately like seeking her out, like, okay, why are you here? And she said, she's the one that said in the hallway and said, why aren't I in there and you giving me this news? She was with me and she was so powerful about her talk and her passion that um, Ms. Nancy Pelosi pulled her in and said, come on, you're going to come on stage with me while I go on TV. So she did. She fainted, but she did. <laughs> so it, again, we have to spread the hope to the next generation and let them know. And I'll never forget her face. One of the gentlemen that we lobbied from Georgia, um, we went to his office, we sat with him, told our story. When he was running for office last year, he sent a little card, the postcards that come to the mailbox that we all throw out. When I got home, she was holding it. She was so excited, she was shaking. I said, why are we excited about a political campaign? <laughs> and she said, because look, so there's his face in the front. She turned around and she said, women's, I'm gonna get it, women's Health Medicaid Act, he passed it. It's right here on this paper. And she was shaking, she said, I did that. I told him to vote for that. And I said, yes, you did. And she's like, I get to vote this year. And she was so excited, she was shaking. I'm like, all of that happened. Because I told her there was no shame. We have to be activists. We have to work. And it was amazing to me. And that's kind of, that's kind of where I want to land this. I want to let you know that last month we had something called Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I think we shouldn't have that anymore. I think we should have Breast Cancer Action Month. Because we're all aware now. We all know what's going on. Now it's our job to go out and spread a little bit of hope and a lot of education. Thank you very much for letting me share with you today. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. You were lovely. Oh, um, you. I'm curious about how opportunities for volunteering or getting involved. I find myself young and recently graduated, and I have a lot of time on my hands. Not that much money, but I have time. <laughs> um, I was just kind of curious if you had any recommendations on organizations or things to do. I mean, I've done everything from sewing heart-shaped pillows for women to print <gasps> yes, place under nice. their arms post-surgery, yep. but, you know, I would like to do more and probably yes. something not just around money. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's kind of key as well, especially in the corporation that you work for. They're so generous and philanthropic. The, the, you work here, I presume. Um, what, you, what your talent is, no matter what your specialty, if you're in marketing or if you're a database administrator, if you're something <laughs> equally cool, there are nonprofits out there who need your help and they could work for a year and not get done what you could do in a day. Um, so if you would like to connect with me, I'd love to give you a list of organizations that could use it with your specialty. Um, for example, I have a, um, a friend who's in IT, and he's a security IT analyst. So he's really, really good at that. And he helped a nonprofit in Kenya um, saving elephants because they, had, they take in a lot of money with credit cards and things like that, and they weren't very secure. So he spent probably a week helping them, but they, could, they had spent tens of thousands of dollars trying to find people to help, and they couldn't get it done. But he did it in a week. So you don't have to spend money. You just have to use your heart and your, and your mind, and you can really do it. So yes, please do connect with me. I'd love to get you a list. And what you really like doing. You know, if it, if it is fundraising, if it's event organization, anything like that, there's so much that needs to be done. So yeah, I'd love to. Awesome. Love Thank, to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, you. One thing you mentioned that really struck me was um, when your friend told you to get a second opinion, and um, culturally you were kind of nervous about doing that. Uh -huh. Have you also found in your experience speaking that because there are, in some cultures, people are less open about talking about this stuff. And have you found that conversation changing when you talk to different groups of women, uh, women of color or mm -hmm. immigrant women or you know women of different backgrounds where uh, there isn't that history of talking about this very openly to yeah. begin with, so it's a bigger hurdle to overcome? Yep, oh my goodness, without question. Um, I have a friend who is in the New Jersey area. She has started a nonprofit that exclusively deals with English as a second language. She's um, Latinx. Um, 
she goes with women to the hospital to help translate things, not just from Spanish to, or English to Spanish, but also medical speak to non-medical speak. And I know they would not speak to someone like me because I, I, you know, I'm not in their cultural arena, so I can't address them. But it's an immediate gravitas, right? When she walks in the room, not only is she stunning, but clearly she knows what what she's talking about. So yes, generationally as well, that's a huge thing, right? Like my mom's generation, especially as a, as an immigrant, no one, your doctor is God. That's what happens. Um, but there are also other cultures that I had never even considered that are the same way. Um, I received a phone call once from a gentleman who said, um, my wife has breast cancer and she's really afraid. Um, would you be willing to give me some words of wisdom? I'm like, well, just have her call me. And he's like, I can't. And I can only talk to you from 5 to 5.30 PM, like on Thursdays. So and I'm like, OK. She was, she is, they are Amish. She's not allowed to use the phone. She doesn't have internet. She has no access. He, as someone who works with the outside world, he was allowed to have correspondence for half an hour a day or half an hour a week with someone. So literally, this poor, very young man was asking questions about things that he was wildly uncomfortable with, but that was the only avenue we had. So we kind of have to work around the structures that we've been given. You know, if the cultural barriers are there, we can't make that. We have to be more, less barrier driven and more sponge driven. Instead of me casting judgment on you and saying, put your wife on the phone, I just, <laughs> I just said, OK, and let's kind of dive in from there. Um, but you know, and we're only talking about the US. You know, when we go outside, it's either much better or much worse, depending on what continent we're in. Um, I have a, a friend who's a single mom in South Carolina. And she said, when I was talking to her, she's like, I really need help. And I said, oh, I have all these great resources. Here they are. And I started naming off these websites, starting with the Pink Fund. And she said, Oh, I can't. And I could, I could feel her shut down. And I'm like, what's going on? And she said, I don't have internet access at my home, and we don't have any devices. And I found that shocking, because statistically, like 95% of people have access to this. And I told her that. And she said, thank God she was very patient with me. She said, let me explain what that looks like as a single woman of color, mom of two sons in South Carolina. Yes, we have access to the internet, because my children are exposed to the internet at school. But what my 10-year-old son is not going to do is go wait in line at the school library and type in breast cancer resource, breast cancer resources for two reasons. First, he's not allowed to type the word breast into the computer. Second, he's embarrassed. He's not going to type that in anyway. So here in the continental United States, there are, there are ramifications because of poverty lines and things like that. So yes, she needed help. Yes, she was desperate about it. But good heavens, there, were, there was no way around it for her. So literally, we ended up mailing paperwork down to her, which, is, which sounds like something from you know, the 1950s. But we, we have to kind of work with the ramifications we're giving with the spheres of influence that we have. So I do find it changing generationally. But the more, the more I learn, the less I know. You know and, and with, our, um, with the Native Americans, it's the same situation. Some of them have great amounts of resources, and some don't. Like a stage zero diagnosis is a death sentence, because they simply don't have the resources. And it's infuriating. But it kind of fuels my fire, too. You know, I'm like, the more word I can spread about this, we might be able to help people. You know, put, put a device in their hands, you know, no matter how we can help. So yes, I, I do find that. Thank you for that question. Um, amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, I have a question. I, we have some friends where actually the man is, is going through treatment right mm -hmm. now and had leukemia. And so, um, like, I've been trying to help, like, organize a community of people to help with, like, things that they need and stuff. But one of the things I've observed is they both are kind of self-employed and activist type of people. And um, <laughs> But they, they seem to kind of almost, it's hard for them to, like, take help and it's almost like they they feel like they need to still be saying hey we're still working we're still trying yeah. to do this and and I'm like you know what we're trying to take this off of you so you don't have to feel mm -hmm. all that and just wanted to hear from you like any thoughts on you know if you've kind of experienced that feeling of having a hard time taking help and how best to like you know kind of I mean I'm trying to nudge and just like you know, yep. don't worry, just let it kind of let let things go a little bit more. Yep. But it's it's I could see it's hard and I don't want to push too hard. But just any yep. advice or thoughts you have on that? It's, it's almost impossible. Right. Especially and, and I don't want to seem matriarchal, but for women, especially like we give all the time. We don't want to. The, the, the sentence I said almost all the time. No, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. 
How could I be fine? I look at pictures of myself and I want to yell at myself, you were not fine. Look at yourself. Um, and I, I would constantly say no to things. And then finally, a friend of mine said, um, when, you, when you really open up to me, you say things like, I'm just so tired. There's no other word I can use to describe this. Um, but she called me at a really weak moment one time, and, she, and, I, and I was crying because I said, my kids want to go to the park and swing on the swings. And I said, I was so tired, I couldn't even zip up their jackets. How am I going to walk all the way down to the park? Like, that's how low I was. And she just happened to call me at the right time, and she's like, what? And I'm like, I can't go to the park, and they zip it up the jackets, and the little shoes are untied, blah, blah, blah. So the next morning, and she drove in from another state. The next morning, she was at my house, and I'm like, oh, I didn't have my wig on, the house is a mess. And she said, last night after I talked to her, she said, I was crying, I knew you were crying. She said, I'm in my bathtub, scrubbing my bathtub, and I thought, how is Heidi doing this? She's got to weigh 300 pounds. I, I didn't weigh 300 pounds. She, she's like, how could she bend over to scrub without getting sick and all the, you know, the smells that are around? How could she do that? And she said, she can't. Like, the answer hit me. She can't do this. And she can't take her kids to the park. So she said, I brought back up. My friend's going to take the kids to the park, and I'm going to clean your house. I'm like, oh, no, I'm fine. And she's like, actually, you're not. And I'm not going to take no for an answer. Go lay down. So I did. And I realized at that point, I was being selfish because she wanted to help. She didn't have the financial resources to help me. All she could do was clean my bathtub, but that's what I needed from her, desperately. And so I think I would coach that, say, say that to them, all we want to do is help you, and this is all we know how to do. So you're kind of robbing us of our, if they spent their whole lives helping others, what if someone were to come up to them and say, we don't need you to do that anymore. We're going to do our own political activism. Thank you, you sit down. That would be insulting and cruel. Right, you have to not be insulting. You have to let people in. So just kind of gently coach them and say, just try one thing, not anything big, but just little things, and see see what they do. Because people do need it desperately. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I usually don't share this, but I'm part of that tribe. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. Um, but I think that you. T what I love about you is that you're very real and. You hear so many pink ribbons and all these stories, and it's great. But it, if, as a survivor, it's it's sometimes nauseating, right? <laughs> and the people that made I was that person. Like I'm fine, I'm good, I'm good, you know. And the people that really, really just helped me were the ones that did that. Just were like, I'm over, or I'm sending cleaning lady, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And I didn't have little kids at the time, but I, you know, was newly married and young. And but the, and then the people who just made me feel real. Like I had a friend at Starcom who would be like, when I came back from leave, he was like, yeah, we know you, where you really were. You weren't going through cancer. It's like, you were down in Malibu to Rio. He was funny and that's probably inappropriate, but he, he, he just made me laugh like every day. And, and um, this other girl, I came back and had no, um, I'd, I wore a wig. I was like insecure about it, you know? And mm -hmm. finally my hair was like, like short enough to not have a wig on. Mm -hmm. And I came back from Christmas break and I was like, screw it. I'm, you know, I'm wearing, I'm going. <laughs> and I walked into a meeting and nobody said anything. And I was like, if you were some girl with long hair and you showed up one day with a pixie cut, everyone yeah. would be like, oh, well, you got a haircut. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so I was just like, I was angry. Like I was, you know, uh -huh. it changed my emotion. And then this girl, Carly Miller, I'll never forget her. You might know her. She's in the industry. I would literally do anything for her if she asked me. She came in and she's like, damn girl, it's like in the pixie. And I, it just, those, it's just being human and like mm -hmm. loving them and just making them laugh. And one guy sent me, before it was okay, sent me this fake pot plant. You know, I mean, just funny, <laughs> funny stuff. So I just wanted to add, because nice. I yes. never speak up about it. And oh my gosh, and yes. Inspired me. So. Well, thank you. Thank yes. You. I'm going to take this from you and give you a yeah. hug, too. Oh. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. You look amazing. Um, I, I, think, I think for me, I'll never forget um, the gentleman who helped me with the, the eyelashes. When I finally got back to go see him, he hugged me. And it doesn't sound like much, but everyone else is like, oh, I don't, I don't know. You know. And you could tell in their minds something was going on like they wanted to. But I'm a big hugger, and everyone else used to be. Until that happened, and then they would like hug like this. Oh, and like come, come on, they're gone. It's okay. Come on in. But he hugged me, and like for a long time, you know, and it wasn't, you know, he doesn't prefer girls, so it was a big deal. It was okay, and it, and I was like so happy. I wanted to cry because no one had, you know, my kids did, and my husband did, of course. But when the world kind of says, oh, don't don't touch her, you know, she's she's in pain. Yeah, but that. When you're in pain, that's when you need it the most, right? Just something, you know, kiss my forehead, something, anything. So I really appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that. It was really great. I strongly encourage you to um, 
look up George Sledge because he really truly is a genius, and I. And I, and I cannot stress enough what the importance of research does. So like, if you have $100,000 laying around, give it to that man. Um, but if you, have to do, if you have time and talent, like that's, that's something important as well. Um, his nurse told me one time that he was, he, he really is a rock star. He was giving a tour to people from um, Japan, I think, around the office. And they're very, they were very um, syncophantish, like, oh, Dr. Sledge, you're wonderful, you're wonderful. And one of them said, you know, over the course of your life, you must have saved thousands and thousands of women. What does that, what does that feel like? And he said, you know, I don't, like, it's just science. I don't know that I have. And he said, but I can tell you for sure, I know I saved one person. And she said, she said the nurse said, I'd never even seen this before. He said, right there, it was a picture of Noah. Dr. Sledge holding Noah on his desk. And so the nurse is calling me from the elevator crying, listen, I gotta tell you this story. And I'm like, what? She said, I don't even know that picture was on his desk. And she said, he looks at it to remind him, just one, sometimes all you have to do is save that one person and the rest will follow. So just amazing. So I do encourage you to look him up and do connect with me on social media if you can, because I'd love to help if necessary, if not just kind of cheer you on from afar. So thank you very much, everyone, appreciate it. Thank you.